Welcome to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Matthew 9, 14 through 15. And now let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we praise your name. God, we thank you for your sovereignty and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you are a provider. We thank you, Lord, that we can look to you and trust in your word as trustworthy and true. We thank you, Jesus, for your death on the cross. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for your empowering us and strengthening us and encouraging us in times of difficulty. Lord, we praise your name for your resurrection. And we thank you, God, for eternal life that you have given so freely. Lord, we praise your name for the faith to believe. In your name we pray. Amen. And now for the reading of the scripture. Matthew 9, 14 through 15. Then John's disciples came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Now, I'd like to argue that the main idea of these verses is as follows. These verses teach that Jesus is the bridegroom foretold in Scripture. They also foreshadow the crucifixion and ascension of Christ. And so now let's move to the exegetical portion of the sermon. So, spirituality in the Old Testament, in the, in the Second Temple period and under the Mosaic Law, was heavily connected to ritual observance. So, for example, you had to, at least in the Second Temple period, only take so many steps and only do so much work on certain days of the week. If you were going to prepare food, it had to be prepared in a certain way. The celebration of festivals had to be done in a certain way. As we'll see in later verses, uh, mourning people who have died had to be accompanied by certain instruments and professional mourners. There's a lot of ritual observance in the Jewish life in the Second Temple period, and that was seen as a mark of true spirituality. And so it was going to be expected that Jesus, <clears throat> as a rabbi, would lead his disciples in this observance and the practice of the standard fasts. And not only that, but just in terms of the, the general rabbinical tradition, that he would follow in the rabbi's steps and he would teach people according to their customs. And so it was very jarring that Jesus essentially walked away from that uh, because he did not operate in the standard way of the Pharisees in any way, shape, or form, and in fact, was essentially giving something new. So it's important to note that it's John's disciples who are saying this, and they had certain expectations which were already not being met. So in other words, they didn't quite understand why Jesus was not walking in the way of the Pharisees and in the way that they understood the law to be lived out. And we're going to see this similar lack of understanding in John the Baptist himself when he's in prison, and he essentially articulates the idea that, you know, Jesus, are you the Messiah or is it someone else? And we're, we're going to see this, that they, they expect the Messiah to look a certain way, they expect the Messiah to act a certain way, to follow certain standards, and when he didn't, they got very confused. Now, it's also important to understand that this was a sincere question. This was not a challenging question. This was a sincere question. That's why Jesus essentially gives them a polite answer. Um, he doesn't chastise them or anything of that nature. He actually gives them the answers to why he's not causing his disciples or having them fast. And the thought is, is that this might very well be related to the very verses that are prior to this, where there's this massive feasting banquet. And so, again, the thought is, is that there's a logical order to the text. And so, like, well, wait, why aren't you guys fasting? You're having this big feast. What's going on? And this is sort of, again, the big issue. The big issue is how do people receive Jesus? Uh, there's going to be a mass amount of people that receive him by simply ignoring him or by sending him away and continuing the status quo, continuing in what the people of the day were doing. However, there's others that are going to receive him with great rejoicing and feasting. And so again, when the king is present, it's a time of rejoicing and feasting and celebrating. Now, the second thing to note here is that fasting is not actually commanded per se in the New Testament. It's optional. Uh, additionally, fasting is not a measure of one's holiness or spirituality, even though it is beneficial. So there's a major shift here between seeing spirituality as primarily something religious or ritualistic to a shift in seeing spirituality 
as something internal, as a holiness or a set-apartness. It's much more linked with morality and not even just negative morality, which would be don't do this, don't do that, but also positive morality. How should you treat others? What should you do? Should you be celebrating? Should you be rejoicing? Should you be forgiving? It's going to be a positive morality, and that's going to designate the spirituality that goes forward under the new covenant. Now, in terms of the purpose of fasting as a private action, uh, it's with the intent of focusing one's attention upon the task or the need or a personal relationship with God, uh, even to the exclusion of what one will eat. And I would also argue that fasting as well allows us to use the natural desire for food and essentially turn that towards God. So when we get hungry, we essentially go to God for our spiritual food. And so it's kind of got this interesting uh, piece to it when you do a food fast uh, that essentially allows you to have these pulses or desires for God that are being redirected off of food. And additionally, it's a time to devote one's time to God or to the study of the word. Now, interestingly enough, we see this in Isaiah 58, 6 through 7, which I'll read now. Isn't the fast I choose to break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and the homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him, and not to ignore your own flesh and blood? Even in these verses, we see that fasting has a purpose. And in here, again, part of the fast was the denial of the self for the purpose of serving and loving the other. Now, Jesus' answer is an answer, not a rebuke. Again, there would be an appropriate time for fasting. It wasn't that the John's disciples were totally wrong. There would be a time for fasting. Um, it would be when the bridegroom is taken away from them. So in other words, a time of mourning. And interestingly enough, this is in the aorist passive. It is a non-voluntary separation. In other words, Jesus is not going to desert them, but he would be taken away. And again, I believe this is a reference to the crucifixion, and it's even an allusion to Isaiah 53, 8, which reads as follows. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? So right in the middle of the famous Isaiah 53 verse, we have that Jesus was taken away. <clears throat> in other words, he was removed. It was, it was not a voluntary thing. He was removed or taken away because of oppression and judgment. So we see this reference again to the crucifixion and potentially as well the ascension here in this Messianic prophecy being related in the New Testament. Now this being taken away is going to be referenced again in the future in John 16, 16 through 22, where he would die and their grief would be temporary. And so the disciples were not meant to fast in that in the immediate moment when the king was present, but when he would be taken away. The next point I'd like to make is this idea that fasting again in the Old Testament differs from the New. In the Old Testament, again, you're going to see fasting for religious festivals, observances, and for mourning. In the New Testament, again, it looks more like spiritual refreshment and time to focus on God. So let's move to the expositional elements of the text. Fasting. The only required fasting under the law was on the Day of Atonement. Uh, but the Pharisees had actually added many other fasts in Second Temple Judaism, including a two days a week without water. These fasts were used for prayer and penitence. And it would be considered odd for Jesus and his disciples not to engage in them. Uh, but again, there's this link to the wedding. And a wedding festival could last up to seven days. And the rabbis would actually pause all of their instruction to hail passing bridal processions. And you weren't allowed to fast or engage in other acts of mourning or difficult labor or work during a wedding feast. Now, here's the interesting thing. When God is literally walking among you, it's a similar type of situation. It's not time for mourning. It's not time for fasting. It's time for celebration and joy. And so we're seeing then in this, that with this pass between the time of fasting and the time of mourning, a foreshadowing of the crucifixion and ascension. In other words, Jesus would be taken away. People would put him to the cross, he would die, he would be here for a time, and then he would be taken up to heaven. So again, we're definitely seeing the crucifixion light here, possibly the ascension as well, uh, but the mourning was most likely going to be a reference to the three days in the tomb. Now in terms of the Christocentric setting, we're seeing Christ as the bridegroom. So there's something neat that's kind of being revealed here. Yahweh and Israel had a type of relationship. But Christ is going to have a different type of relationship. So Christ is now being seen as the bridegroom, but the question naturally would come, 
who is he going to be married to? Who is this wedding feast of the Lamb with? And what's interesting is, as you're going to see over the course of the New Testament, is that it's revealed that those who were initially invited wouldn't necessarily come, and that anybody else is being brought in. And so we're seeing the, essentially, Israel is not going to be the primary focal point for the wedding to the bridegroom. Rather, we're going to see the church come up now and be the focal point of the wedding to the bridegroom, where Jews and Gentiles are brought together. Now, this is not a replacement. Okay, It's not a replacement in any way, shape, or form. The, the Jesus is the bridegroom was always intended to be a believers only, whether Jew or Gentile. <clears throat> Israel and Yahweh, or God, have a different contract, right? They had the contract of the Old Covenant. They also have a covenant, if you will, in the New Covenant as well, which is going to give them land and a place and things of that nature. Uh, but there's something different going on here with the bride and the bridegroom. And so we're seeing this theology start to develop. We're also seeing Christ in the crucifixion, that he would be taken away. It would have been unconscionable to the disciples this time to see Jesus as being forcefully taken away, to see Jesus as deserting them, to see Jesus as leaving, really as anything other than a conquering king, they were going to have a hard time seeing it. So he's seeding these things now. He's seeding this stuff now in their minds that, oh, no, 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 there will be a time when I'm taken away. And again, passive heirs, that time is going to be when I'm taken away uh, involuntarily. <clears throat> in other words, I don't want to be separated from you, um, but I'm going to be separated from you. Now, understand that to mean he's not saying that he is being crucified apart from the will of God. That's not what he's saying. He's simply saying, I won't want to be apart from you, but I will have to be apart from you. We're also seeing a little bit of the resurrection as well, because the time of mourning is going to end. The time of mourning will not be permanent. Okay, So we're seeing some implication of the resurrection as well. And finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about the application. So I want to talk again first about the power of prophecy, and we really do need to hit on this extensively. In the early church and for the first thousand years of the church age, prophecy was the primary means of evangelism. When people went out and evangelized, it wasn't uh, necessarily through miracles. It wasn't necessarily through a testimony. It wasn't uh, through a lot of these other things that people typically think of nowadays and think of evangelism. It was a proving of who Jesus was from the scriptures. It was a demonstration through messianic prophecy that this was true, that the record was true, and that one should give one's allegiance, repent, and believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so I want to talk about the power of prophecy and why, the power, why prophecy has power in terms of these messianic prophecies contained in scripture. So again, the scripture is the very word of God. It goes out, it does not return void. It does what it intends to accomplish. Messianic prophecy was intended to accomplish the situation of convincing, and I'll say it like this, uh, being in concert with being born again and things of that nature, but to demonstrate or show, or intellectually convince at least, people that Jesus was the Messiah. It is intended to be a validating thing. And unfortunately, uh, in modern American Christianity, we've sort of walked away from that. And there's a reason why. We actually walked away from it a long time ago. Uh, because around 1000 AD, uh, the, the Jewish rabbis at the time <clears throat> were essentially going on the attack against Christianity, intellectually, and they were, they were essentially attacking Messianic prophecy. And so Christians stopped using Messianic prophecy to demonstrate the truth of Scripture. And so what you're seeing is about a thousand years where Messianic prophecies just fell out of use. And I think it's time for resurgence. I think it's time to bring Messianic prophecy back to the forefront, allow it to do what God intended to do. Uh, again, the seeing of the prophecy and the prophecy fulfilled is very strong. And again, when in concert with the Holy Spirit, I believe that God is using that uh, to show people and to demonstrate to people the truth of his word and the truth of who Jesus Christ is. So Messianic prophecy has power because it is the word of God. Now, for the second applicational point is the truth of the bride of Christ. Uh, I believe that knowing now that we are part of the bride of Christ, we should be living one in preparation. And this means that we should be living... Uh, and walking out our sanctification. We should, be, we should be dying daily. We should be picking up our cross daily. We should be mortifying the flesh. In other words, purging sin from our lives. These are things that we should have as focuses or foci of our lives. We should be putting great attention on a regular basis to sanctification, to washing our minds with the word of God, to repenting of sins, to seeking out reconciliation with others, these are core aspects of the Christian life and being set apart, and these are things that we do in preparation for being part of the Bride of Christ at the Wedding Feast of the Lamb.
And the reality is this. The reality is that we are part of this group. We are part of the Bride of Christ. And as such, we need to own that fact. We need to own the fact that we are called to something higher. We need to stop living in the world and of the world, and we need to start living as and who God has called us to be. And so again, this is part of the entire Bride of Christ, that God is transforming us and making us someone worthy or a people worthy of being married in this sense to his son, the bridegroom. And there's a really beautiful uh, symbolism in this. And again, it really is a redeeming and saving of humanity from a state of sin and muck and mire and bringing them up into a beautiful and holy state. And so with that, I'd like to conclude. As we run the race of our lives, we are to look forward to the union of the bride and the bridegroom that we will participate in when we are in heaven. Additionally, we should argue for the gospel persuasively from the scriptures through messianic prophecy. And now I'd like to close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we praise your name. We thank you, God, for your holiness. We thank you for your word and your messianic prophecy. We thank you, Lord, for your instructions in evangelism. And Lord, we pray for opportunities to share the gospel, to impart your truth to others, to disciple people, to love and serve you and love and serve our neighbor. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Mm-hmm.